Hey everyone, so welcome to lecture number five in uh, international politics. Um, today we're going to continue our look at theories. So we're gonna look at our last couple of theories uh, and then we'll start looking kind of at different issue areas. Um, we will be having a review um, synchronous class on Thursday um, because I imagine that some of you definitely have some questions related to these theories. Um, so we'll be able to kind of go back, take a look at them and uh, I'll answer any questions that you might have. Uh, so the last couple we're going to look at are, um, are constructivism and critical theories. Um, these are a little bit different, so it's a little bit of a change of pace with these theories. Um, some students um, will just instantly look at these theories and say, this really makes sense to me. Um, this is everything that's kind of been missing when I've been hearing about these other theories. Some students, and this is quite understandable, will look at these theories and say, I don't understand what's happening here. Um, and that's also quite normal when we're, we're dealing with the, uh, these theories kind of um, the first time. So we'll start with constructivism and then we'll do a quick look at uh, critical theories at the end uh, with a particular focus on uh, feminist IR. Um, so constructivism is a critique um, of neorealism and neorealism um, in terms of, uh, or critiques them, uh, not really in terms of what these scholars say, but more in terms of what they don't say. Uh, so constructivism doesn't necessarily say that everything that neorealism and neoliberalism say are wrong, um, the way that they, they were, look at the, the world, um, but more constructivism comes from the premise that what they say is incomplete um, because there are certain parts of in, international politics that they just leave out and that these um, factors are really important. Um, and in particular, um, what is left out of neorealism, neoliberalism, liberalism, is the content and sources of state interests and the social fabric of world politics. Um, so remember when we were talking about neoliberalism and neorealism, uh, interests were something that was assumed, right? So for example, in neorealism, we talked about how states are um, pursuing uh, uh, security. Um, and then in, in classical realism, they've been pursuing power. So these are things that are assumed. Um, in constructivism, we take that as problematic, the idea that all states would have the same interest. So this is something that constructivism seeks to explain rather than assume. Um, also, the idea that international politics is made up of social facts. Um, so much of what we've been looking at when it comes to neorealism, for example, is measured in terms of, say, military capabilities, so material facts. Um, so if we want to understand decisions, we look at the difference in capabilities. Everyone's able to perceive these difference in capabilities. And so we measure international politics as reactions to the number of tanks somebody has or the number of guns somebody has or the amount of money somebody else has. Um, but in constructivism, uh, it, it, international politics isn't just made up of, of material facts, but also social ideas. And then ideas are important um, in international politics. So constructivism, all the different theories we've looked at have a lot of diversity within them. So not everybody within a particular um, uh, theory will agree with each other. So there'd be debates within neorealism, there'd be debates within liberalism, there'd be debates within neoliberalism. Um, and, and that's normal and that's the case with all theories. Um, but I would say it's particularly the case within constructivism. Constructivism in many ways um, is a a, a wider approach than any of uh, any of the other ones. Um, some actually would even question whether it, we, we should even be le uh, labeling constructivism as a theory itself, and maybe whether it's more kind of a, an approach. So we could say that, for example, neorealism, uh, neoliberalism and liberalism, because they assume actors are rational, we could put those within the rationalist approach. Um, and then Constructivism, it, because it's not assuming actors um, act rationally, uh, constructivism is a different approach at the level of rationalism. Um, for, for the purpose of this course, whether it's an approach, a methodology, a theory, it's not important for us. Um, but I do want to highlight the diversity um, that exists within constructivism and just how immense it is. Um, so anything that we, we take a look at when it comes to constructivism, it doesn't mean that all different constructivists will agree um, with it. Um, but there are a couple things, there are some things that um, all constructivists will agree on. So first, the social construction of knowledge and the social construction, uh, or, and the construction of social reality. So let's start with the construction of social reality. Um, so first um, is the fact that um, as human, 
um, the way that we interact with each other is based on social knowledge uh, and social construction. So, for example, language involves a whole bit, bunch of different constructions where we come to a shared understanding of what a particular word means, what a particular concept means. Um, so, for example, if we take any material object that we're looking at, a chair. Um, why is a chair a chair? Um, does it have to be based on the um, material um, facts that go into it? So you place wood in a particular configuration and it becomes um, a chair just automatically? Um, or is this something that we had to come to an agreement on in terms of we label something that looks like this is a chair and something that looks like something else is a bench instead of being a chair? Um, and then something else, um, you know, still that could have four legs is, is a table. Um, and then we could have differentiation between a table and a desk, right? This comes down to um, how we define things um, socially. Um, so they, these weren't kind of predefined, pre-given facts about the world, material facts about the world, they're social facts. Um, so even things like guns, guns only have meaning because we've given it meaning, right? So yes, a gun based on its construction could fire a projectile, but the fact that, that this is used in, um, in, in war, right, is because we've come to this understanding that this construction of this object is a weapon and it could be used for um, killing other people um, in wartime. If we had constructed this and um, no one ever agreed to use or nobody ever used it against a person, it was only used safe for hunting, for example, and no one ever thought of using it for, um, for warfare, then this would not be an item of warfare. It would not be. Um, so in terms of how we use and view different objects, um, it depends on the social construction and the so and social perception uh, and identification of, of different things. Um, now, and so that's where we've so far been talking about material objects, but then if we take it a step further and even just the material objects, so many of the concepts that we talk about in political science and international politics aren't material in any stretch. They're purely social through and through. So what is a democracy, right? Democracy is a concept that you can't find in nature and look and point and say democracy. Um, it, democracy is something that's been created through human language and human experience and shared understanding of how the world works. We've taken concepts together, we've used language, we, we've used communication, and we've developed the concept of democracy. And just so many of the different terms um, war, peace, uh, democracy, cooperation, uh, conflict, um, all of these terms aren't things that exist um, in nature as tangible objects that you could pick up like a rock. Uh, these are all concepts that we have developed ourselves um, as people and given meaning to. Um, so you couldn't pick up a democracy and say democracy. Um, in, um, so much of what we're under, trying to understand when it comes to international politics and just a, pro, a focus on materialism, on material objects, misses some of the most important concepts themselves. So that's the first step is the understanding that um, the material world is um, social, right? There's a social component to, to the material, uh, to, sorry, the so, uh, to, um, to reality, there's a social component to reality. The second is the critique that even knowledge is socially constructed, right? So even as scholars, there's um, we have to admit to um, our own subjectivity um, in uh, in knowledge production. So within many of the rationalist type schools, so your neo-realism, your neoliberalism, your liberalism, it's viewed that scientists, you know, or uh, social scientists, political scientists can look at reality, look at what's happening, and they can draw an unbiased interpretation of what's happening. So the scholar's own uh, mind or own experiences don't come into how they um, interpret this objective reality. Um, facts speak for themselves. Um, in constructivism, um, facts don't speak for themselves. Um, our own experiences, our own biases, um, our own position within um, society affect how we look at reality. 
two people could look at the exact same facts, could look at the exact same events on the ground, could look at the exact, hear the exact same speeches, um, and come to two very different understandings of what has happened. Um, and that's, uh, for constructivism, that's normal and that's to be expected. Um, and so that is a part of the scientific process that we also have to understand that as scientists, as observers of international politics, so you as students of international politics, when you're writing papers about it, from a constructivist perspective, you have to be honest that your own experiences can shape how you view this reality. Let's go a little bit deeper on some of the common ground. Um, so the social world is made up in, of intersect subjective understanding, subjective knowledge, and material objects, right? So constructivism doesn't um, pretend that there's no material objects, there's no material facts within the world. Um, the question is, are we able to know these material facts or do material facts speak for themselves without um, our understanding? So there's material objects, say for example, not gonna question whether a rock exists there. If you walk into it, you'll um, stub your toe or face resistance. Um, so it's not to ignore the you know, uh, laws of physics or stuff like that and pretend that they don't exist. Um, they do and you know, they will operate um, on the world whether we understand them or not. Then there's subject, subjective knowledge. So this is the knowledge that we have ourselves and the understanding of the world that we have ourselves. So it, it might be in terms of uh, our understanding of the material objects around us, um, our understanding of the social setting. So when I look at chair, how do I define a chair myself? When I see something, how do I know whether it's a chair or not? How do I know whether it's a table or not? How do I know whether it's a democracy or not? Um, and then there's um, intersubjective understanding, and this is what allows us to live in a social world, right? So to be able to communicate with each other, we have to have some shared understandings of how the world operates and what is within the world. So for example, if I tell you chair, if I tell you democracy, if I tell you war, we're gonna have a similar understanding of what these concepts mean, right? So intersubjective understanding means a shared understanding. Um, so when we you think in language, when we say things, most people are going to have a fairly similar response. Now, there's some difference between intersubjective understanding and subjective knowledge. Um, so, for example, while if I say war, if I say democracy, there's going to be certain elements that we'll all think of when we think of, say, democracy. But there's certain parts of my, uh, there's certain going to be certain uniquenesses to my understanding that may not be shared more commonly, either. Um, it could be that I've done more study, so I've got more knowledge on it um, than, say, for example, when we talk about democracy in the community of our classroom. Um, so it could be that there's certain no subjective, there's certain knowledge that I have from greater level of experience with studying it. Um, it could be just based on unique interpretation or unique viewpoint um, that any of us could have from our own experiences. So it may not be more knowledge, but it could just be different knowledge um, because we've all experienced democracy differently. Um, but still, despite these individual small differences, we could still say a word like democracy and have an understanding of it. We could still say rock or gravity and have a, an understanding of what the other person is trying to convey. Social facts, which are facts only by human agreement and which account for the majority of facts that in IR different from, uh, differ from rocks and flowers because unlike the latter, their existence depends on human consciousness and language. So this is like what I already said about um, something like democracy or war um, or cooperation, right? These don't have meanings in the physical world in terms of you can point and touch it like a rock or a flower. Um, which rocks and flowers are, yes, still subjective, under, uh, are still social facts in the sense that, yes, you can touch them, but why do we separate a rock from something around them? But there still is a material component to it. Um, they exist in the world. They would be there whether humans understood them or not, whether humans created a word for rock or not, that rock would still be there. Um, democracy unless we have a shared understanding of it, unless we build it ourselves using language and communication and building an intersubjective understanding of it, it doesn't exist in the world, right? It's created through human agreement. 
Um, and without this human agreement, it doesn't come to exist. Um, and the majority, constructivists argue, the majority of the facts um, that um, that we'll study in IR are actually these types of social facts. Although individuals carry knowledge, ideas, and meanings in their um, heads, they also know, think, and feel only in the context of and with reference to collective or intersubjective understanding, including rules and language. Um, so this is kind of the difference again, where we talked about the difference between um, subjective understanding uh, and intersubjective um, or, or, um, subjective knowledge and uh, subjective understanding. Um, so we do hold certain items within our are bright, um, so understandings of these different social facts or these different material facts in our brain, um, but they only have meaning with reference to this intersubjective understanding. So we learned it from communication with others. Um, and we learn it based on the rules of language that exist. Um, so we can't learn something if there's, if there's no way of communicating a, a concept within the rules of our language, then we can't gain an intersubjective understanding of it. Um, so, to a certain extent, our social facts are constrained by the rules of our language. And then finally, agents and structures are mutually constitutive. Um, so rather than, for example, um, sometimes um, in different theories, um, in neorealism, for example, it could be the structure causes the behavior of agents, um, or the structure causes the preferences of agents. Um, so the structure constrains and leads different actors to make particular decisions. Um, it, in, in other cases, in different other theories, it could be that the different actors cause a particular structure by their behavior. Um, so if we want to explain the structure, we have to look at the behavior of the actors as causing it. Um, and that's more of the approach that's taken by a lot of the different rationalist theories, um, either the structure constrains and causes the behavior of the actors or the actors cause the behavior of other actors or cause um, the formation of a particular structure. Um, in a, much of constructivism, there's the understanding that um, you can't understand agents without reference to the structure and you can't understand the structure without uh, um, uh, looking at the agents. One doesn't exist without the other. So think of, for example, our classroom. Um, can you have a, the concept of class or of school without the actor? So think of the classroom as a structure, right? It's a social structure with particular rules for how, um, and for, for how behavior will, will go about and for what's supposed to be happening, right? So you could think of the school or the classroom as a particular structure. There's different level, um, powers within it and stuff like that. Um, does, can you, does the classroom exist without students and a teacher? I, I mean, yes, the, the, the room might exist, but does it have a meaning of classroom? Does it have the structure of classroom without the concept of students and or the actors of students and teachers to inhabit it. Otherwise, it's just a room, um, not a structure. Um, similarly, do teachers and students make sense without the, as actors, make sense without the concept of classroom or school? Um, can we, um, or learning? or uh, teaching without some form of this, the, one of these structures, does the concept of student or, um, or teacher make sense? Um, not really. Um, so in a sense, we can't talk about school causes teacher and student. And, and we also can't really say student and teacher causes classroom because they need each other. They, create each other in a sense, because they, they are each other. Um, so a, um, if we want to understand um, what the interests are of someone, then we look at what is the role within a particular structure. So if we want to look at how are you going to behave within the classroom, then we look at what is your role, student, what is the structure, um, 
classroom. And then from there, we can understand um, your different interests. And it's not that classroom causes you to have these interests. It's that because you are a student within this structure, you have these interests. Um, these interests are who you are. Um, same thing for teacher. Um, so we'll return a little bit to this. Um, another example that um, is often used to kind of um, explain the idea of mutual constitution is, um, is slavery, right? So can you have the structure of slavery without slave owners and slaves? Can you have the agents of slaves and slave owners without the structure of slavery? Um, not really. It's not that there's a structure of slavery that causes there to be slaves and slave owners. It wasn't slaves and slave owners who caused um, there to be slavery. It was a structure that kind of defined uh, the identities of uh, different actors within a structure. Um, so you can't have the structure without those agents, and, and you can't have the agent without that structure. So they define each other. Um, they define the role and the identities within it. So based on your position within this structure, you have particular roles, you have particular identities, and these identities um, produce your interests. Um, so let's take a look at the difference between neorealism, neoliberalism, and constructivism. And we're going to look at it on a few different kind of categories. So first is focus on material versus social world. Um, so we've already talked about this a little bit, but just to go a little deeper. So the environment in which uh, agents or states uh, take action is social as well as material. Uh, and so this is for constructivism, right? So yes, there are material facts, but there's also many, many social facts. And even the material facts depend on your social understanding of them. So on your subject subjective understanding. Conversely, neorealism and neoliberalism structure are defined in terms of material capabilities. So we understand the structure of international politics based on the relative power capabilities of different states. Um, so for example, to use how would say a rationalist so a neoliberal or neorealist look at nuclear weapons compared to how does a constructivist so for a neorealist for example the threat of nuclear weapons depends on their destructiveness right because if you want to find out how much power someone has you look at their material capabilities the greater destructiveness of their nuclear arsenal the greater the threat uh, that they pose and the greater the power that they have uh, it doesn't from a neorealist perspective, then matter who possesses the nuclear weapons, they are capabilities and they cause uh, someone to be a potential threat. For constructivism, structure are defined in terms of ma material capabilities and ideas. So yes, nuclear weapons still exist. Yes, nuclear weapons have their destructiveness. But if we wanna look at how threatening they are, the threat of a nuclear weapon depends on who has them. So for example, in the Cold War, if you're Canada, and you look at the US has nuclear weapons and you look at the Soviet Union has nuclear weapons. Do you perceive them in the same way? Well, is based on um, the community that we have or the relation we have with both different states, how likely is it that the US is going to launch nuclear weapons against Canada? And during the Cold War context, how likely was it the Soviet Union would launch nuclear weapons against Canada? Given the um, different type of relations that we had with the US versus the Soviet Union, for Canadians, most Canadians would say that the uh, nuclear weapons are not threatening to Canada, if anything, they're protecting Canada, but the Soviet missiles are threatening. If they increase the number of nuclear weapons they have, that's a threat to Canada. The US increased the number of nuclear weapons they had, that's not a threat to Canada. So it depends on ideas, not just on, so um, how do we understand the capabilities of other states as opposed to just um, any capabilities viewed in the same way. Now let's compare the same theories, but in terms of interests. Um, so the setting can provide agent states with understandings of their interests. Uh, it could constitute them. Um, and so that's the constructivist uh, perspective. Um, so understanding of their interests, it constitutes them. So for example, in just by nature of being a student within the structure of, of classroom, you understand that your interests are to gain knowledge, pass the tests, pass the course, 
and then move on to, you know, eventually university and gaining a job. So you understand what your interests are. Um, and it's not that, and you, you, you might have different interests when you inhabit a different role within a, uh, a different structure. So, for example, in the classroom, your interest is to gain knowledge. When you go out and go home and watch TV, your interest isn't necessarily gain knowledge. It might be relax, have enjoyment, because uh, you're within a leisure social structure. Um, or if you're in the workplace, your interests are get paid, um, and that's because you're an employee within a workplace. So your interests change um, and are understandable based on what role you occupy within a particular structure. So what structure are you in at any given time and what role are you occupying within it? For neorealism and neoliberalism, we assume that institutions and structures only constrain behavior. So we, and we assume interest. So it might be that interests are, somebody wants to um, gain uh, as much money as possible, or it might be that we assume that somebody wants as much security as possible, or they want to um, gain as much power as possible. And then we look at the structure and see, given this interest, how would somebody with this interest, how what behavior are they going to take given the constraints placed on them by the structure? Um, so it's not that they, depending on the different structure that they inhabit or the different role within the stru structure, that they then learn or understand their interest from that structure. They have always the same, from neorealist perspective and neoliberal perspective, they always have the same interests, really. Um, and it just depends on what constraints operate them on any given time to figure out what their behavior would be. Uh, social structure can include elements like culture and norms. So let's uh, unpack a little bit what these norms are. Um, so what do neorealism, neoliberalism, and constructivism understand by norms? And norms is something that we're going to talk a lot about a lot when we talk about things like international organizations. So neorealism, norms don't matter. Um, states uh, do what they have to do given the constraints placed on them and their desire for material power. Things like ought, um, what you should do, doesn't come into play. In neoliberalism, norms serve as a regulative function, helping actors with given interests maximize utility. Agent states create structures, so norms and institutions. So for example, in neoliberalism, say two states are having trouble solving the prisoner's dilemma, so coming to a cooperation. They may create a norm to a rule of behavior, to a, nor a rule to regulate behavior, or an institution to regulate behavior, so that they can escape from prisoner's dilemma and reach cooperation. Um, so it's something that they desire creating, they create themselves, and they create it to serve a particular purpose. Uh, so it doesn't really change their interests. Um, it helps them reach particular, it helps them to maximize their utility given their interests. Constructivism, constructivism has the deepest understanding of, uh, of norms. So norms are collective understandings that make behavioral claims on actors. Their effect, uh, effects reach deeper, they constitute actor identities and interests, and do not simply regulate behavior. So in the case of um, neoliberalism, we said that they regulate behavior, so you create it for a particular function to help push you towards a particular um, outcome. Um, in this case, it's not something that necessarily pushes you towards a particular outcome. Uh, a norm is um, uh, helps define what you do in a particular situation. So like I said, um, uh, so it's collective expectations about proper behavior for a given identity. Um, so again, looking at kind of the student role, if you hold, uh, or the school structure and student role, if you're a student, um, within the structure of um, school, right? So you have a particular identity at a particular time, um, then there are certain expectations about how you're going to behave. And so these are the norms. Um, so a particular role within a particular structure has a certain set of expectations about how they will behave. Uh, and these are common understandings of what somebody should do. So we all have certain understandings about what the, the teacher person is supposed to do within the structure of um, uh, school. Um, we have a particular understanding of what students should do within 
uh, uh, school and what they should not do. Um, and, um, and these help, um, these norms help to create your interests and for this is what you're supposed to do. And, um, and so we have kind of um, your identities produce your interests um, and norms, all of them kind of help define each other. Now, norms, because we say it creates an expectation for behavior, so a shared expectation of behavior. So what should students do? What should teachers do? Um, what should uh, an employee do? What should an employer do within kind of the, the context of the workplace or school or whatever the different context might be? Um, many constructivists in the early years and many still, um, they kind of viewed um, constructivism really grew in prominence at the end of the Cold War. So there's this optimism. And the idea was we could create norms um, about appropriate behavior. We could create collective expectations about proper behavior for people with get, or groups or people within with a given identity. We could create these new norms and create to create progress, right? So good norms can emerge um, and good norms will help move us forward. So this is very liberal in terms of progress oriented constructivist uh, mentality. Um, bad norms exist as well, right? So there could be shared expectations that actually lead us backwards. Um, yes, we create new norms that help progress, help human rights, help peacefulness, right? But we can also create new norms that decrease the likelihood of peace, um, create shared expectations of greater conflict, that it's appropriate to be aggressive, um, that it's appropriate to be prejudiced. Bad norms can emerge as well. And it's not a necessity of time that the creation of new norms will always lead us linearly towards a better world. Um, it depends on, uh, it can, we can create norms for a better world, we can create norms for a static world, we can create norms for a worse world. Uh, and neither is necessarily the, we, we don't know which one will come in advance. Um, and so how should people make decisions about how they behave? Um, and uh, neorealism, neoliberalism on one side, and then um, constructivism on the other side um, have different views on what motivates behavior. So what do people take into account when they're making decisions? Um, in neorealism and neoliberalism, they focus on what's called the logic of consequence. And this means that a decision maker is a calculating machine who carefully assesses different courses of action, choosing whichever provides the most efficient means to, their, uh, to her, his or her ends. Um, and so in this case, um, it, this sounds a lot like our, our rationality uh, definitions that we had. Now, it says a calculating machine. This is overstating it slightly in the sense that whether someone calculates everything perfectly or doesn't calculate everything perfectly, the idea is that when we're making a decision, we think about the consequences and we choose the, uh, the option that um, maximizes our benefits and minimizes our cost. So which is the best way of achieving the, our desired end? Um, so we think about the consequences and then we choose the one with the best consequences. Constructivism, um, focuses not on the logic of consequence, but on the logic of appropriateness. So it's not to say that consequence doesn't matter at all to um, constructivism, um, but there's also another logic for making decisions. Um, and so constructivism focuses on the logic of appropriateness. They also have other logics, habit practice, and arguing. We won't go into them in this course. Logic of appropriateness means the decision maker is a rule follower who acts out of habit. Uh, or decides what to do by posing the question, how is a person in my role or with my identity supposed to act in this circumstance? So this sounds a lot like what we were talking about when we were talking about norms, um, so expectations of shared behavior. So in terms of when someone's making a decision, it's not about what is the best consequence, it's about what is the, what am I supposed to do in this particular circumstance? Um, now, some scholars will say that, and some constructivists and, and some non-constructivists will admit that there's an element of both in decision. So for example, logic of uh, appropriateness might come in and say, within you know, my identity as a student, there are, or as a teacher, what am I supposed to do and what am I not supposed to do? Um, things I'm not supposed to do, I eliminate from consideration. 
um, because they're unthinkable, right? They think, just think that I, I should not be doing it in this particular role. But there might be multiple things that would be appropriate. There's not one thing I have to do here. There's multiple things I'm allowed to do. Um, all of them would be permissible. Um, all of them would be appropriate, given my role, uh, given my identity, and given the circumstances. Um, and, and so if we then make the decision on which one to choose, then possibly it's logic of consequences comes into play. So it might be that logic of appropriateness helps us at the menu of available options. So we don't consider all options, we only consider the subset of options that are viewed as appropriate. And then logic of consequence helps us make the decision then within that smaller set. That's possible as well. It, it also could be, it, uh, it depends on how appropriate or inappropriate something is. So logic of appropriateness comes in when something is either really taboo or really, really, really strongly strong norm, but otherwise consequence comes into play. Or it could be that logic of appropriateness comes in unless the costs of acting appropriately are too high. So there's multiple different ways that we could try integrating them, but neorealism, neoliberalism, liberalism, they focus on the predominantly, almost exclusively on logic of consequence. Um, and while constructivists tend to be more open to the possibility of both, they focus predominantly, particularly those who work on norms, focus predominantly on the logic of appropriateness. So that's a brief under, uh, introduction to constructivism. We're not going to go much deeper on constructivism here because there's so many, like I said, there's so many different strands. Um, it's a little bit more complex to understand. Um, so I don't want to just go in depth, uh, kind of skate, uh, skirt the surface of too many different, um, uh, too many different uh, constructivist theories. So we'll move on to critical theories. Um, so all the theories um, that we've seen for the most part, constructivism being a little bit hybrid here, um, but most of the ones that we've seen have been problem solving theories. So certainly neorealism, neoliberalism, and uh, liberalism. So they're theories that take the world as it is and attempts to make institutions and relationships work more smoothly within that given framework. So for example, if you're a neorealist, you take, okay, this is the world, way the world is structured. Um, and so if you're applying, uh, so then neorealist theories are developed to help us understand problems that exist within the world. And by gaining a greater understanding, then hopefully we can help solve the problem. So for example, um, after the 9-11 terrorist attacks, there's a massive growth in scholarship within IR um, to, uh, addressing the, uh, the issue of terrorism. So why, what are the motivations of terrorists? Um, what actions help defend against terrorism, to help to prevent it? So it's taken a world of, okay, terrorism exists. Um, and how can we um, develop institutions and build relationships um, that help to minimize the risk of terrorism for us. So we're not transforming the entire society. We're not transforming the way that the world works. We're just given this particular problem, how can we solve the problem? Problem is people are attacking us. How do we solve this problem? Um, and then once a new problem emerges, then we focus on trying to solve that problem. Um, and so realism, liberalism, neoliberalism are very much fit within this approach. Um, constructivism, it depends. A lot of constructivism actually falls within problem-solving theory. There are critical streams of uh, constructivism. So again, where I say constructivism is very broad, um, there would be some critical streams without critical theory, uh, and there's certainly a greater affinity between critical theory and constructivism or um, shared understanding than there would be between a lot of, say, your um, your realisms and your liberalisms um, having a shared understanding with critical theory. So then what is critical theory? Uh, so critical theory um, uh, is a theory that questions the very framework, the very world, the problem solving theory takes for granted and is concerned with relations of inequality and the issues that are unexplored or made invisible within more mainstream approaches to IR. Uh, and so it's often looking at hidden power relationships that, um, that are built within the structure. So you might have critical race scholars who are looking at how um, just through a problem solving lens, 
at just trying to solve problems that emerge within day to day, we're missing important inequalities um, that exist, um, racial inequalities that exist within world politics um, that don't go away just by solving the problem. So it might be that if we're just taking the world for granted, as problem solving theories typically do, that we're missing, um, from that perspective, from the problem solving theory perspective, there's certain questions that we ask and there's certain questions that we don't ask. And those certain questions that we don't ask, some of them are actually really important uh, involving racial inequality, gender inequality, um, economic inequality, just things that don't appear to us when we're taking the world as for granted because we're missing. There are certain issues that just we miss because they're built into the very fabric of the world. So a lot of, for example, um, uh, feminist scholars um, will look at how um, the very structure of international politics um, pushes women into the periphery and imposes costs uh, on, on women or um, prioritizes the masculine over the feminine. Um, so treats the masculine trait as a superior one. Um, and these things aren't necessarily apparent um, on without a conscious effort to look at these power structures, right? To many people looking politics um, or international politics shouldn't be masculine or feminine, right? Many IR scholars say, you know, I'm, uh, my concept on developing aren't sexist. I'm, um, I, I'm gender neutral in my study, but what they're missing are these underlying power dynamics. So like many problem solving theories, critical theories are often still focused on power, um, but the powers that they're uh, talking about is often emerging from structural inequalities. So what, it, what, um, what power emerges say from uh, racial inequality, so different privileges that white people might have over other racial minorities, or what privileges within IR exist for men over women, or what privileges, what forms of power um, that are just baked into the structure. So um, are, um, are, do rich states have or rich people have over poorer states or poor people? Critical theory, um, so problem solving theories is about solving problems, but critical theory um, is, takes a step further in terms of being emancipatory, meaning that critical theorists don't only seek to understand the world, they want to change it. Uh, and when I say change, I don't just mean solve problems in terms of let's stop the terrorism threat, but it might be rather than just uh, stop the terrorism threat, let's change the econ economic inequality that's built into the world that's leading to terrorism, um, or let's uh, stop the, um, Kind of the um, cultural homogenizing pressure that is leading to this problem, or let's stop the gender inequality um, that's leading to the continued oppression of many people, if we're trying, um, or it's leading to increased conflict. Um, so let's liberate people, let's set people free, let's free them from these power hierarchies. So a brief understanding, and this is going to be a very um, simplistic um, a kind of introduction to feminist IR theory. Um, we'll cover some of the big things that, we'll look briefly at some of the big things that feminist IR theory looks at, um, but we're also gonna leave out the vast majority of it. Um, it's just more to kind of try to catch your interest, but also without necessarily uh, losing anyone yet. So try to keep it the things that are more easily understood so that got a found, uh, foundation that you can then push forward in subsequent courses. Um, so let's just start with kind of a thought experiment. So does the following trait describe a man or a woman? Uh, and normally we would kind of ask and say, you know, uh, is it in the classroom, is adventurous and masculine or feminine word is affectionate. Um, and all too often people say, oh, neither, um, stuff like that, um, because they don't want to be viewed. They understand that, um, this is kind of a loaded question um, and, and don't want to be, uh, are kind of publicly changing their answers. But most people, if they look at a lot of these words, even if they don't internalize it themselves, um, would be aware of what the social um, expectations are related to men and women and how those expectations would fit um, or what the different stereotypes that exist when it relates to men and women. So 
um, on some of them, right? The stereotype would be that a man um, is more adventurous, a woman is more affectionate, a man is more aggressive and arrogant and competitive, a woman is more creative, a man is more daring and egotistical, a woman is more gentle and gullible, a man is more hostile, a woman is more pretty, a, a man is more quantitatively skilled and rugged, a woman is more sensitive, spineless, sympathetic and whiny. Um, now, there's negative and, and, and positive characteristics on both of these. Um, so arrogant isn't a great, um, uh, uh, isn't, uh, isn't necessarily a, a great term. Um, hostile is not necessarily a great term. Whiny certainly isn't, gullible certainly not, spineless certainly isn't. Um, but if we think in terms of world politics, right, which of these uh, terms are ones that in world politics we would view as a good thing or something that could be helpful. Um, so adventurous, that could be helpful in, in states. A state that's adventurous um, could, could be a good thing. Um, affectionate, a state that's affectionate. I mean, um, personally, I, th I think that'd be great. I think that if states cared more about each other, that'd be great. And that's what a feminist would, would put forward, but that's not something typically in your security focus, right? In your normal problem solving security focus, affection is not great. The possibility of being aggressive, too much aggression bad, but still the possibility of being aggressive, um, competitive, daring, egotistical, um, rugged. These are good things for a state or for a leader. Um, being affectionate, being uh, gentle, being gullible, being pretty, being sensitive or spineless. These are not terms that when we're thinking about a leader in foreign policy, we don't want a spineless leader. Uh, we don't want a whiny leader. We don't even want necessarily a sympathetic leader. Um, when you think about traditional metrics for the commander in chief, the person who's leading your foreign policy, you don't want a pushover. Right? You don't want a softie who other states are going to walk all over. Um, you want someone who can stand up for the interest of the state. Um, and so if we look, take a look at many of these characteristics, we associate some of them with men more. And these characteristics are ones that we're going to value more. And so um, this plays a major role in, uh, in feminist IR theory. So, a lot of feminist, some feminist IR, and we'll look at it, is just looking at the, the issues of where are men, where are women, what are men doing, what are women doing. Um, but they push it deeper also to the concepts of gender roles and gender norms and gender expectations. Uh, and so feminists define gender as a set of variable, but socially and culturally constructed characteristics, such as power, autonomy, rationality, and public. They're stereotypically associated with masculinity. Their opposites, weakness, dependence, emotion, and private are associated with femininity. Uh, there's evidence to suggest that both men and women assign a more positive value to masculine characteristics. Importantly, uh, definition of masculinity and femininity are relational. Right, so uh, let's unpack this a little bit. So variable, but socially and so as culturally constructed characteristics. So gender are a set of characteristics that are assigned either to the masculine or feminine. Um, they're always socially defined, so they're not inherent in men or women uh, or in masculine or feminine. It is a social construction. So similar to what constructivists are talking about with social construction. They're not always the same at all times. So they can be variable in different cultural contexts or in different times the characteristics that are assigned to masculine or feminine could be different. The, uh, what, what's important though, is that they always are different. Um, and then, so there are some that are stereotypically associated with men or masculinity. There are some that are uh, um, associated with femininity. Um, now, men or women, when we assess these different views, not just in terms of politics, when we ask uh, when, uh, there's different tests for rating these different characteristics. Both men and women tend to associate the masculine characteristics. So if it, for example, rational as opposed to emotional uh, or uh, autonomous instead of uh, dependence or power as opposed to weakness. The characteristic associated with masculinity tends to be ones that both men and women rate higher as being better uh, than the other. Um, and they're relational in that you can't really have the masculine characteristic without the feminine characteristics as well. So power is meaningless without weakness. Um, autonomy is meaningless without dependence. 
uh, public is meaningless without private. Um, so uh, it, you require both of the different concepts as kind of these uh, dichotomies. Um, and so many of you will say, okay, consciously, I don't necessarily think that rationality is better than emotion or public is better than private or power to weaken. On some of these different characteristics, um, people may not say, um, hey, I think this one's better, but there's even been tests of people's kind of intuitive. Um, so their unconscious expectations or, uh, or their unconscious valuation of different characteristics. And men and women, when it comes to, when we kind of get past the deliberative effort to appear not biased, when we go towards the unconscious, right? Um, the underlying level, we see strong for both men or women. We see similarly, we see um, strong racial bias um, when held by both white and black people, racial biases against black individuals when we look at the unconscious level. Um, and so these are sh shared understandings um, and the masculine or feminine are, um, uh, and the masculine traits are more valued than the feminine. Now, it's important to differentiate here between masculine and feminine and male and female. Um, gender is a, or, uh, is, uh, a social con construction, right? So you might look at someone and say, hey, you know, I'm a woman and I'm powerful, uh, or a man could be emotional. Um, there's nothing to say that a man cannot have a set of masculine, but also a set of feminine characteristics and that a woman can't have a set of masculine and feminine characteristics. What does typically is typically true is that A, we automatically assume men will be more likely to have masculine traits compared to feminine ones. We typically assume that ma men, even to the extent they have feminine ones, are more likely to have masculine uh, traits than feminine ones. Um, within men who have more feminine traits, um, we will devalue those. So even comparing the rank, relative ranking of men, men who have greater levels of masculine traits within just politics in general, society in general, but also the foreign policy elite in particular, um, more masculine men will be more valued or viewed as superior to men who are a mixture of masculine and feminine. Uh, and certainly to those who are very effeminate and uh, are still male, but have a lot of feminine characteristics. So just because somebody has, not every man man is purely masculine, not every woman is feminine, doesn't, there's not a one-to-one, -one, male, female is a biological characterization and the other are social characteristics that are associated with, with one sex, but aren't, um, there's not a necessary relation there because they're constructed, right? Really, men and women, based on biology, could be powerful. Men and women, based on biology, can be autonomous or rational or uh, operate in the public or can be whiny. Men or women can be either. When we're looking at gender, we're looking at what are the gender roles that are constructed, right? How are men brought up? How are women brought up? And, what, and how are they taught to behave? Um, and that's where we start getting into gender. So feminist IR is emancipatory. So the goal is achieving equality for women through the elimination of under uh, uh, unequal gender relations. And so this operates at multiple levels within foreign policy. So it goes to as far as underrepresentation of women in the foreign policy decision-making elite to uh, achieving equality for women within societies. Um, right, so looking at how women are disproportionately impact, women and children are disproportionately impact, uh, impacted by wars. So even though often not fighting in wars, the cost to them in terms of um, the structure, uh, destroyed economy, in terms of uh, sexual violence within war, um, in terms of destruction of cities and, and whatnot, women bear a tremendous um, portion of um, the, the cost of war, but it's not something when we talk about war, we talk about casualties as cost of war or material as cost of war. We don't talk about um, the, uh, the kind of the cost when it comes to those who aren't fighting in war. Um, so some of the questions would include, 
why international politics is perceived as a man's world and why rem uh, women remain so underrepresented in the higher echelons of foreign policy establishment, the military and academic disciplines of international relations. Um, so some of this is changing, right? We see more and more women as you know, senior professors in, in politics. We see more and more women uh, in foreign policy elites, but you still, if you just want to see how much progress there still is in terms of politics being a man's world, look at um, the difference in treatment that there was for Hillary Clinton versus Donald Trump, right? In terms of qualifications to be commander in chief, so not just president, but the commander in chief portion of it. So lead the military, make foreign policy decisions. Um, Donald Trump was just kind of assumed to be able to do it because he's a man and because he, you know, talks as if he's powerful um, and he'll be a tough negotiator and no one will stand up to him. But no one really criticized or questioned um, that he'd be able to do that um, despite having zero experience in foreign policy. Um, it was just kind of assumed that, yeah, he's, he's a tough guy, so he'll be able to do it. When it came to Hillary Clinton, you can't really imagine a more qualified commander in chief from the sense of um, tremendous experience in politics from um, you know, being first lady for eight years, to being in the U.S. Senate, to being U.S. Secretary of State. Talk about a long um, preparation, the amount of world leaders that she already had a personal relationship with, a strong relationship with the knowledge of the world, the knowledge of the foreign policy making process. You can't imagine really a more qualified commander in chief, um, other than perhaps someone who had served in, in the military as well. Um, but that's not something Trump had done. But there was always questions about, you know, is she tough enough for commander in chief? Does she have, uh, will she be able to handle or step up for, uh, in a foreign policy crisis? Um, and, you know, that's a fair question. How will anybody handle a crisis? Until they've done it, how would anybody handle a crisis is a fair question. But why was it a question that more Americans seemed to need to ask for Hillary Clinton as opposed to Donald Trump, given that in terms of who we should believe was better prepared to make these decisions, we should have expected, just based on experience, we should have expected Hillary Clinton. But getting these tough characteristics, getting these masculine traits that are valued for commander in chief, getting those respected was much more difficult for her where they're more soon for Trump. Uh, issues that get prioritized in foreign policy are issues with which men have special affinity, right? So the issues that men care about tend to also be the ones that foreign policy is about. So whether it's about kind of the, um, the economy um, and the masculine driven economy, um, or whether it's about conflict or territory or those type of resources that men typically have greater control over, those are the issues um, that get talked about uh, in foreign policy, not the one that women typically also care about, uh, that men care about less. Um, so more education, um, healthcare, um, the uh, parts of the economy that, the non-formal parts of the economy. Um, so the majority, even as women take greater and greater roles in the workplace, the majority of non-paid work is still done by women. Um, so uh, it just means that women are getting more and more busy as they're working in the regular economy, but also in the, um, in the non-paid uh, uh, economy as well. Um, so why, why is it that these issues aren't ones that we typically talk about in foreign policy? Um, how military conflict and behavior states in the international system are constructed through or embedded in unequal gendered structural relations and how these affect the life chances of individuals, particularly women. Um, so women pay, like I said, women pay a disproportionate cost um, when, when there are wars. Um, but we don't really understand this unequal gender relation, uh, even in terms of the, the way this uh, concept of the state um, concepts of military um, are constructed, uh, there's a gendered component to all of these. And so part of what feminist IR is trying to do is look at um, how is there also, there's not just a hierarchy of states in terms of um, their material power relations. There's also a hierarchy within international politics related to um, gender expectations um, and a gender uh, and similarly there's a racial hierarchy there's an economic hierarchy within 
international politics as well. Um, and so part, uh, so feminist IR would be trying to uncover, right, the, the power dynamics that aren't because of military power necessarily, but that are because of this gender structure within international politics, just like those who would be working on critical race um, theory uh, uh, would be looking at, uh, or race in IR would be looking at racial structures and what role do they play in producing international politics outcomes and trying to dismantle these racial hierarchies, these racial inequalities, uh, and those working on uh, critical um, um, economic issues, you know, the uh, trying to um, dismantle the economic hierarchy. So that's it for today. So next time, like I said, we're going to take a little bit of a, uh, we'll have a bit of a review. So come prepared with your questions. Um, the session will operate based on, I'll respond to whatever questions that you might have about these different theories. I just want to make sure that we, uh, that there's at least some level of understanding um, of the theories before we start moving on. It, at this point, I perfectly, and it's perfectly understandable, like I said, if you don't have perfect understandings of them yet, um, a lot of that will come just from um, getting further into the course. It'll just start making more sense as we do more IR. Um, but I want to make sure that at least some of the main concepts are well understood before we move on, just so that we don't develop greater understandings um, uh, as we move forward. So that's it for today.